The silent, black-robed and veiled women came with silver bells on their ankles and silver zills on their fingertips. Daniel feasted them each day, and they danced and sang for six nights. They danced the dance of courtship, the dance of marriage, the dance of mating, the dance of conception, and the dance of birth, and the dance of destiny. And they sang a song for each dance, but not a word would they speak to anyone. On the seventh night, in her chambers, Queen Donate hummed the song of mating, as she carefully prepared for the coming rite of love. The silent, night-veiled moon maidens had bathed, oiled, and perfumed the queen. Smooth as alabaster was Donate's skin, and soft as rose petals were her cheeks. Sacred symbols and magical formulas had been painted on her breasts and belly, an unguent of honey, pomegranate juice, and secret herbs had been massaged deep into her nether lips. She was robed in the sheerest of Egyptian linen, through which her enticing charms could be glimpsed, as if through a veil of morning mist, enhanced with adornments of carnelian and lapis lazuli, set in richest gold. Meanwhile, King Daniel himself, regally prepared, awaited his queen and priestess in the flower-decked sacred bower of their rooftop temple. At, at the muffled sound of a gong, one of the veiled moon maidens placed a powerful blend of enchanting incense on the braziers and then quietly withdrew. Daniel's consort entered in silent splendor her face half hidden behind the golden eagle mask of Anath. She let fall her purple cape, loose the girdle of golden hands at her waist, and came to Daniel's couch. Moist lips touched his, soft arms embraced him. She caressed his loins and found him ready, and as he entered her body, he breathlessly whispered the litany of the sacred marriage rite. With this golden gift I would be, with this draft I plant my spark. The floodgate of his passion opened within her. Nurture deep the dew of sunfire in thy vast and vital dark, he gasped as his seed rushed forth to fill her womb. But as soon as he was spent, she roughly pushed him away. With a mirthless laugh of triumph, she ripped off the mask, revealing the blazing eyes of the warrior goddess herself. Daniel fell back, dazed, depleted, paralyzed in shock. He was like an old man, powerless and aching in every bone. Now, Daniel, live out your life and count the empty years, Anath said. She donned her cloak with a swirling motion, transformed herself into the giant she-eagle, and with an explosive beating of her great wings, she sprang up and away into the starry night. As he lay dazed and trembling on the neutral couch, Daniel tried to convince himself that it had been an evil dream brought on by the narcotic fumes of temple incense, for that's how they used the kid in those days, with a tinkling of silver bells, Queen Donate herself entered and came to him. She too kissed and embraced him, and though her lips tasted of honey and her hair smelled of jasmine, she did, he did not respond. And when she pressed his loins, he showed no sign of desire. King Daniel had been completely and utterly unmanned. In a hoarse, holding voice, he tried to explain what had happened. Danate found his story difficult to believe. She was stricken with a deep sadness. I am sorry that my poor earthly charms are not the equal of your dreams, my lord, she murmured, weeping softly. She rose to leave, but with her movement the bedclothes fell away, and she gasped in surprise as an eagle feather nearly two cubits in length fell at her feet. Forgive me for doubting you, she declared. We are indeed cursed. With only ten days remaining until summer solstice, Daniel grimly rededicated himself to Baal in a seven-day fast, 
And during this vigil, he stayed alone in the rooftop temple, offering up sacrifices and prayers in the hope of lifting Anath's curse. And finally, on the night of the seventh day, Baal's image appeared to Daniel in a laver of water. Vanate will indeed bear a son, the god whispered. I will see to that. And just before dawn, in the royal bedchamber below, Queen Danate was brought back from her dreams by a touch on her shoulder. She opened her sleepy eyes to behold a bearded face half hidden behind the golden ceremonial mask of Baal. Daniel's wife smiled and held out her arms to welcome her lord. She was eager to yield, but instead of the familiar caresses she expected, larger, stronger hands explored her body. Intoxicating fire flowed through her veins at his touch. She opened to his thrust like a blooming flower once, twice, thrice. She was deeply invaded until the seed was cast within her. Then a take gasped in awe. My lord, you have become a stallion. He laughed. <laughs> I have always been a stallion. And so saying, he doffed the ritual mask, showing her his flashing eyes, his horns, and a nimbus of glory about his head. The son born of this our union shall be an instrument of the gods. Take comfort in that, for his life will be short, Prince Baal told the amazed queen. Having accomplished his purpose, the cloud rider clapped his hands and vanished in a flash of lightning and a roll of thunder. The next morning, the Kotharat silently made ready to depart. When the sisters were all mounted on their donkeys and their high priestess was seated in her sedan chair, the great lady lowered her veil and spoke to Queen Danate and King Daniel for the first and last time. A male child will be born to you, a plaything of the gods, but his heart is with the moon and he will come to us one day. Danate was soon with child, but she concealed the truth of its patrimony and Baal's dire prediction from her husband. She hoped that ignorance of his true parentage might keep her son from following his destiny in this meeting and early doom. In keeping with his divine origin, the Prince Akat of Bashan was born upon the very day of Bertal Equinox, on the occasion of the new year and the annual sacred marriage rite. King Daniel officiated at his son's formal dedication to Baal Hadad, whose warm sun and gentle rains yearly germinated the fertile fields. And for this was the future king's traditional responsibility to the land he would rule. The land grew to early manhood straight and tall in a time of peace and plenty, and he was in joy and the pride of his indulgent parents. Only his older sister attempted to restrain him with prudent advice, which she always lightheartedly ignored. Akat grew up headstrong and willful, even for a crown prince, in the proud lineage of the Raphaim, who were descended from that mighty race of giants who had ruled Canaan before the great flood. In Akat's seventeenth year, on a hot sunbright day preceding the young man's birthday, King Daniel was seated under his awning just inside Arnam's city gate, dispensing justice to his people. He had spent half the morning adjusting creditors' claims against the recent widow's estate so that she might have a dowry to marry again, and he was in the process of arranging an apprenticeship for the orphan son of one of his deceased soldiers when he heard a cry of alarm from the lookout on the parapet of the barbican. Daniel adjourned his court and climbed aloft to see for himself what the commotion was all about. A ship seemed to be approaching, not from seaward, but rather over the broad, dry plain to the north sailing toward them just above the shimmering mirage on the horizon. At first, King Daniel supposed that it was just that, a reflection from the Sea of Kinnereth. But as the purple-sailed vessel drew closer, the king was forced to accept the reality of an ingenious craft that was part boat and part wagon. At the helm stood a dark-bearded giant dressed in the scorched leather of a blacksmith. 
He was none other than Kothor, the craftsman of Mount Zaphon. With the skill of a master mariner, he brought his sailing wagon around, luffing the sheets to stop just outside the city gate. King Daniel, young Prince Akat, and all of their retainers came forth and fell on their knees before the god of invention and progress. You honor our house, great Kothor, Daniel declared, and your land ship is a marvel. But how do you sail over rocky ground, Akat asked, still kneeling. A question will ask. Actually, I have devised a way to make it fly. But people are not ready for that yet, the god replied. My heavenly colleagues don't even think people are ready for the wheel, he added under his breath. And you must be the lad of cut. And Kothar said, and he had a motion for the young man to rise. A cot stood up to his full height and looked the god square in the eye without blinking. Kothar smiled as he took measure of the young prince. You'll do very well. Now, Daniel, before I join your family at table, you and I have matters to discuss in private. When the king and the god were alone in the rooftop temple, Kothor informed Daniel of Akat's singular patrimony and his heroic destiny. Daniel was gripped by a mix of conflicting emotions. Was he to lose his only male heir? Who would assume the continuance of his line? Without a strong young prince ready to take the throne, the kingdom of Bashan would be ravaged and sundered. When Daniel grew old and enfeebled, but the king was awed by the discovery that his son would dwell with the gods in song and story down through the ages. Kothor put a strong hand on Daniel's shoulder. We must tame this heavenly pitch of war or humankind is doomed to rut and slaughter like the beasts for all eternity. Having suffered her wrath, you, above all men, should know this, Daniel. Well, would you give my son your blessing, your counsel? My blessing, yes. But he must not know of his origin or the nature of his quest. He must go forth as an innocent Armed with the magic bow and arrows, I shall give him tomorrow on his birthday. The moth will destroy him, Daniel protested. Well, perhaps, but in so doing, she will come to the end of her evil power. Kothor would explain no more. He and Daniel went down to the feast, where the god became delightfully drunk and entertained them, all with magic tricks and a ribald story about Father L's romantic liaison with two winches on the seashore, whom L had seduced by roasting a peasant, a peasant for them. On the next day, after the fertility dance, in which the celebrants wound the colored ribbons around the Asherah pole, followed by the solemn ceremony of the sacred meal, Kothor ascended the dais and brought forth from his cloak a magnificent laminated bow of ash, horn, and sinew, together with a fine quiver of five arrows. Each bronze tip shaft was fletched with feathers of a different color. This bow and these arrows are my birthday gift to you, Prince Akat, the god declared, but with them I charge you to hunt only the creatures of the air and only the meat eaters among them. I thank you with all my heart for this wondrous gift, divinity, said Akat. But what is this strange injunction you impose? Eagles, hawks, ravens, and vultures are not good to eat. Well, as a huntsman for the gods, your task shall be to thin the ranks of these birds of prey so that the plump fowl and lovely songbirds will prosper in the land. That is Father El's pleasure and Mother Asherah's desire, Godor replied, and he would say no more on the subject.